Diffusion and flow-based models are the core techniques behind the success of generating AI applications. These include generating images, videos, text, and protein structures. The key is the capability of transforming one distribution to another. In this video, we will review the basic idea of flow matching and discuss how we can make it faster with a new formulation called mean flow. Let's use a simple example to illustrate how flow matching works. Here we have a prior distribution and a data distribution. This data distribution can be very complex. We only have data samples. Our goal here is to transform a prior distribution into a data distribution. But how do we characterize this transformation? We model it with the time-varying velocity field, aka the flow. The core idea of flow matching is to learn this velocity field. At any given time and location in the space, we train a neural network to predict the corresponding vector. This is called flow matching. Here are several examples. Once we train our flow model, we can use it to generate new data samples by following the predicted velocity vectors. But there's a problem. We don't know what that time-varying velocity field is. If we know that, we don't even need a neural network, right? Fortunately, finding conditional velocity field is much easier. Let's first draw a sample epsilon from the prior distribution and x from the data distribution. The path between the two samples is just a straight line. We express a point zt on the line as a linear combination of noise epsilon and data x. We can set the velocity vector as x minus epsilon. Similarly, we train a neural network to predict this velocity vector. Any point on this line share the same velocity vector. We repeat this by drawing random pairs of samples from the prior and data distributions. This gives us many conditional paths between them, and lots of training data for our flow model. It turns out minimizing this conditional flow matching loss is equivalent to the original flow matching loss. At a given point zt, we may have multiple conditional velocity vt arising from different sample pairs of epsilon and x. But in expectation over all these pairs, the flow model is trained to match the marginal velocity field. Now how do we transform a noise sample z0 to a data sample z1 using the trend flow model? At time equals 0, we predict the velocity vector v0. Assuming that the path to the data is just a straight line, then we just need to evaluate our flow model once and follow the predicted velocity to get to the data point z1. But what if the velocity field is curved? The point position zt can be described by an ordinary differential equation. This simply means that the change of position zt with respect to time follows the predicted velocity by the flow model. The solution to this ODE involves integrating the predicted velocity over time. In practice, we need to break this down into discrete steps. For example, Aurea method is an intuitive method to approximate the solution to an ODE but we need to maintain a small step size to get a good approximation. The results are poor when we use a larger step size. Other higher order ODE servers are available like RK2 and RK4, but they all have similar trade-off between accuracy and computation. This is why we need multiple iterations to generate good samples. Is it possible to generate samples with just one single step? Here, the flow model predicts the instantaneous velocity, that is, the velocity at a specific time t. Instead, we can predict the average velocity u between any time interval from t star to tn. Here is the formal definition of the average velocity between t star and tn. It's the positional displacement between z end and z star divided by the time interval. Why is this useful? Suppose we have this model that predicts average velocity. We can query this model by setting zt as noise, t star as 0, and tn as 1. By definition, the mean flow model directly predicts the average velocity between the time interval. 
This allows us to generate data samples by running the neural network once. No need for iterative sampling. But the million dollar question is, how do we train this mean flow model? To do so, we need to derive the ground truth vector u target. Let's first simplify the notation by replacing t star with time t. We can move the time interval from t to t end to the left hand side. It's quite challenging to work with an integral. Therefore, we differentiate both sides with respect to time t. This term on the right hand side is a differentiation of an integral. This term is just the function v itself. But here we are integrating from time t to t end, so the result has a minus sign. This is known as the fundamental theorem of calculus. Alright, let's now look at the left hand side of the equation. This term is easy. We can move the derivative operation inside, assuming that the time tn does not depend on the time t. This term is more interesting. Here we are taking the derivative of the product of two functions. In calculus class, we learn how to deal with this using product rule. The derivative is the first function times the derivative of the second, plus the second function times the derivative of the first. Applying the product rule, we get these two terms. Now we can merge the time derivative. Let's plug this back and move the time derivative to the right hand side. This is called the mean flow identity. It establishes the relationship between the average velocity, the instantaneous velocity, and the time derivative. But how do we compute this time derivative term? This is a total derivative. The multiple input variables to this function u are themselves functions of the time variable t. Intuitively, when we track how the average velocity u changes as time t changes, we take into account that the input variable zt, t end, and t could also change with time t. Here, the first term describes how zt change with respect to time t. As we have seen before, this is just the instantaneous velocity v. The second term is just zero, assuming tn does not depend on t. The third term is one. We can now rewrite the total derivative as matrix vector product. This matrix is called the Jacobian matrix. It stores the first order partial derivatives that tell us how small changes in inputs affect all outputs. Here, the dimension d is the dimensionality of the data. In our toy example, we have two dimensions. But for images or videos, this could have millions of dimensions. The vector has a length of d plus 2. Now, it seems that computing and storing the full Jacobian matrix is memory intensive. But since we are only interested in the output change along a particular input direction, this can be efficiently computed using the method called Jacobian vector product. We can compute JVP without materializing the full Jacobian matrix. Let's plug the time derivative back. This forms the target vector for training our mean flow model. So the training process looks like this. We randomly sample a pair of time between 0 and 1. Similar to flow matching, we sample a noise epsilon from the prior distribution and data x from the data distribution. We can then get the interpolated sample zt and the corresponding conditional velocity as x minus epsilon. Using all the information, we can train the mean flow model using a simple regression loss to match the average velocity. Here, the sg denotes the stop gradient operation to avoid higher order gradient computation. Let's take a look at the core results. Horizontal axis show the training compute. The vertical axis shows the FID score measuring how realistic the samples are. The lower, the better. The size of the circle denotes the size of the model. We see very promising results compared to other one-step diffusion or flow-based methods. Perhaps the most exciting part is that this method does not require any complicated training tricks like pre-training, distillations, or curriculum training. I hope you enjoyed this overview. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. <laughs>